for the last few months that uh, since I took charge of ICT, we have had about half a dozen speakers over for ICT lectures. We have had lectures by economists, I recall two of them immediately, Ratan Roy and Razak uh, uh, Katoria. Uh, we have had lectures by development studies experts, uh, Suraj Kumar, uh, who is the director of the who is director of the Niti Foundation. In fact, uh, he, he couldn't make it today. He is in town, but he couldn't make it because he has a meeting in the uh, One lecture each on ethics and on higher education. On ethics, we had uh, Tenzin Priyadarshi, our director of the Dalai Lama Institute for Ethics at MIT. And on higher education, we had Maheshwar Perry, uh, the, the founder and <coughs> founder director of uh, Careers 360. Now, these lectures have attracted anywhere between 40 to 160 people. Today, would be closer to 30, I think. But uh, it, it's, it's certainly because of the rates, uh, or maybe because it's a Friday, 11 a.m. Uh, some members of my team uh, told me recently that I have not thanked the audience enough uh, at the end of uh, these ICT lectures. So I thought I should begin by thanking the audience, even if uh, other than uh, the 10, 12 students from the College of William and Mary who are here, uh, the, the audience members are about 10, 15. But uh, nevertheless, thank you all for coming to these ICT lectures because uh, these lectures are not meant for us, they are meant for you, the public. <coughs> Let me begin by uh, uh, also introducing uh, Gautam Bhatia, uh, who is going to talk on the Supreme Court's liquor ban. Uh, and then he'll, he'll talk in detail about it, so I won't touch uh, that topic. Gautam is a young, accomplished lawyer and the author of Often Shock or Disturb. Uh, this is a book I picked up in 2016, even before uh, the book was released in 2016. I picked it up. Uh, freedom of speech has always been a controversial topic, not just in India, but just about everywhere in the world, including the states, the UK, all over Europe. Uh, remember the cartoons, whether it's about cartoons, whether it is about something else. Uh, and my plan was, <laughs> when I got the book, uh, I was at Bits Planning Goa, my plan was to get uh, Gautam to, to give a lecture at Bits Planning Goa. That did not happen. And then by December, I had joined uh, ICG. Uh, so I thought, okay, one of these weeks, uh, one of these days, I'm going to write to Gautam and get him over to talk on freedom of speech in India. But in April, uh, the liquor ban uh, became important. And I came across uh, a short article that Gautam wrote for the Hindu on the Supreme Court's liquor ban. And as soon as I saw it, I got in touch with him and I said, look, I want you to come to Goa and give a lecture on the liquor ban and we'll have uh, a crowded hall, at least 200, 300 people. And people will be spelling out into the street, so to say. And the Gautam said, well, I have a day job of, uh, as a lawyer, and uh, I need to make a living, and the, the best I can do is maybe there was a Sunday we considered for about five minutes, and then he said, well, will 16th June work? And I thought, oh, God, that's when you have rains. And, and uh, no, looking at the size of the audience, uh, my worst fears, so to say, have been confirmed. <laughs> that if you organize a lecture during the, during the monsoons, if it's going to be a rainy day like today, uh, at 11 a.m., uh, although 11 a.m. is certainly better than having the talk at 6 o'clock when, uh, oh, we have, we have more people coming. Uh, excellent. So uh, the gates were worked out sometime in April, around uh, mid-April or so. And uh, so here we are today uh, with Gautam Madhya uh, to talk on the Supreme Court's liquor map. But there is another link here. Uh, earlier in January, ICT invited Anush Bhuvania, uh, an assistant professor of sociology at South Asian University, to speak on public interest litigation. Uh, Bhuvania's book uh, had, was, had actually came out in December, and I got in touch with him, and we, we could get the dates very, very quickly. Uh, so he came in January, and his, his full book is about the downside of EIM, public interest litigation. And the interesting link uh, to today's talk is that the Supreme Court's liquor ban is based on a, it comes from a public interest litigation. So in a sense, uh, Gautam's talk today picks up from where Bhavania's talk uh, you know, finished, which is public interest litigation not so good. And, and, and Gautam is going to talk about how, in the case of the Supreme Court liquor ban, it is a, a case of uh, judicial overreach and, and, and other things. So uh, now I turn you over to to, uh, to Gautam and uh, uh, to talk on the Supreme Court's liquor ban. I'm sure it will be, a, be an engrossing uh, lecture. Uh, but... 
introduction, you talked about public interest litigation and, and the sense that uh, an institution that has been worshipped for the last 30 years, the IL, uh, is just now beginning to, to be rethought and critiqued in a, in a very basic manner. It's interesting because uh, just last night, uh, the found one of one of the judges who uh, initiated or created the IL passed away. Uh, and uh, his legacy is something that has normally been thought of in overwhelmingly positive terms. So despite the fact that he was actually in the majority and a couple of judgments that were very uh, bad for civil rights, uh, that's often brushed aside uh, on the ground that uh, he created the IL and that, and that is something that's of fundamental importance and a good thing. But as judgments like the Liquor Bank show us, uh, at least now in 2017, with the benefit of many years of hindsight, uh, maybe the label creator of PIL might not be an unvarnished, unvarnishedly good thing. And that's something that I'll be discussing over the course of uh, next uh, few minutes. So this judgment in question is popularly now known as the Supreme Court's liquor ban judgment. And uh, what the Supreme Court did uh, through a three-judge bench was to hold that, um, that within 500 meters of all national and state highways, there could be no sale of liquor and uh, no shop selling liquor could be visible from a national or state highway and there could be no advertisements uh, for the sale of liquor on national highways. Uh, and if you read the judgment, then the basis of the Supreme Court's uh, ruling is that there is a clear link that the court sees between, uh, drunk, uh, between uh, drunkenness, drunken driving and road accidents and a further link the court sees between the easy availability of alcohol uh, next to national and state highways and the possibility of, of drunken driving and thereby road accidents. That's the chain of causation that the court draws. Uh, and, and then of course the, the court acts upon that and passes uh, these orders uh, prohibiting or restricting the sale of alcohol to within a certain distance of national highways. Now when you, when you think about this, uh, it would appear to you that what the court is doing, uh, both in terms of uh, sifting evidence that connects uh, drunken driving to road deaths and availability of liquor to drunken driving on the one hand, and then deciding to act upon that and ban alcohol sales uh, in a certain area, is basically what we think of as a policy choice. So to have evidence and to consider the evidence and on that basis to pass a decision that doesn't just impact one or two people who, have, who are before you in a court case but actually impacts a very wide uh, cross-section of the public not just uh, drivers, not just um, victims of road accidents but also uh, owners of bars or restaurants near highways and not just owners of bars but also people who work in those, in those bars and so in the aftermath of the Supreme Court judgment you had reports that the judgment affected the livelihood of so many people in so and so place uh, and so on. Uh, and so to have a, a situation in which the Supreme Court frames an issue in a narrow fashion, that is an issue with respect to or pertaining to uh, the sale of alcohol and the prevention of road accidents. But what the Supreme Court does has ramifications that go far beyond this, that simple framing, that binary framing of accidents and victims and perpetrators. It goes far beyond that and affects a much larger section of the public. Uh, and that's always been a reason why traditionally the way we think about the role of courts in society, it is that court should only decide cases that involve the rights or obligations of the parties before them in a narrow fashion. Uh, whereas for broader policy decisions, the correct forum uh, is the parliament, it is the executive. Uh, and the reason for that is precisely that when you have multi-layered problems, uh, multi hazard issues, then the judicial forum is simply not equipped to consider uh, in a deliberative fashion the impact uh, that its decisions might have. And the famous American uh, professor, Lon Fuller, he called this, uh, this whole issue a polycentric issue, that is a problem that has many facets. Uh, and if you change one aspect, there will be a ripple effect that will take place throughout uh, the ecosystem. That's the polycentric problem. And Fuller says that, uh, uh, think of this as a, as a web, and a, a very complex and detailed web. And if you pull one strand of the web, 
then you aren't simply affecting that strand, but you're affecting the entire web, and you don't know what the consequences will be like. Uh, and that is something that we see um, in uh, in this judgment, where uh, again you, you think about the case, and the Supreme Court thinks about the case as being about alcohol and road deaths, but the results of it are, are much broader and affect livelihoods and uh, and careers. And you also see how in the in the in judgments aftermath. Uh, there are ingenious ways being devised to get around it. So, for example, in Kerala, there's a person who uh, creates a maze that goes from the highway to his shop, so that if you go in that maze, you end up traveling more than 500 meters. He does that. In uh, in Chandigarh, they basically just denotify all the highways, and so they are no longer state highways; they are now local roads. And again, that's where you can have your your cars on those on near those roads. In Gurgaon and near Delhi, they basically change the entrance of the of the restaurant from front to back and get around in that fashion. And so, and that's another reason why normally you think of the courts as forums which should not uh, interfere or intervene in these kinds of, of equations, because not only will it lead to unforeseen consequences, but people will find ways around this kind of thing. And when they do that, then that leads to uh, general undermining of respect for the system as a whole. Uh, but of course, to anyone who is familiar with the Indian Supreme Court, uh, this is not at all novel or even this is not even in fact uh, the most pronounced of such kinds of, of, uh, of decisions. You are well aware that the Supreme Court presently is managing the Board of Football Cricket in India, the BCCI, uh, which is a private body uh, which governs cricket in India. Supreme Court is basically uh, Taken over its administration, appoint the administrator and is, is, is having hearings on a regular basis to decide how the uh, body should function. And that's in fact even more of an administrative or executive um, uh, act than even this, this ban is. Uh, in another case, the Supreme Court has passed an order that requires national anthem to be played in cinema halls across the country before every film is, is played. That's also um, an order of this kind that's more uh, of, a, of a law than actually a judicial decision. So given that uh, the Supreme Court acts in this way more than just once, uh, given that the liquor ban decision is not really an exception, but is more part of a broader trend of the Supreme Court's um, uh, judgments and, and opinions, the question then is, uh, how did we get here? Uh, how is it that, on the one hand, uh, traditional thinking about, about courts is very clear that court should not be entering policy domains. The court should not be uh, taking decisions that affect uh, the public in a much larger way than an individual judgment does. The court should only focus on the rights and obligations under law of the parties before it. Given that thinking is so sharp and so obvious, uh, how is the Supreme Court seems to be quite diverse from that kind of thing? Uh, and the, uh, uh, the answer lies in three articles of the Constitution and how the Supreme Court has over time understood those articles. These are Articles 32, 21 and 142. Uh, so Article 32 effectively says that the right to move the Supreme Court for enforcement of fundamental rights is guaranteed. Uh, this was supposed to be a very, very important article when the Constitution was being framed. It was called the heart and the soul of the Constitution because the idea was that if the state if the Union of India or any any state violates individual rights that the constitution guarantees, then there should be a right to move the Supreme Court and to get relief for the violation. And so you have a clear fundamental right that says that that all citizens and individuals have the right to approach the court and get redressal for you know their rights being violated. Article 21 is a fundamental right. It says that the state shall any person of their life or personal liberty, except in accordance with the procedure established by law. So the idea originally being that if the state wants to take life or take liberty, there must be a law, there must be a procedure that allows it to do so. And Article 142 uh, says that in any case before it, the Supreme Court might uh, do complete justice between the parties, pass any order. Uh, now this article was very controversial when the constitution was being framed. And certain framers did raise the fear that you are effectively enabling a judicial rule, rule by giving this kind of wide Supreme Court uh, powers that allow it to pass in the interest of complete justice. 
so that that was a fear that was expressed, as we see that fear has largely uh, come true. But articles 21 and 32, at least, uh, do not seem immediately or intuitively connected with the kind of uh, quote overreach that is evident in these judgments, the liquor ban judgments and other judgments. And so there's a further question of how is it that these articles have now come to be at the center of the new judicial role of you know effectively policy making. And again the answer to that is a historical answer. And the answer is that in the first 20 or 30 years of the Supreme Court, it was widely perceived to be a very conservative institution. Uh, most of the battles that happened between the Supreme Court and the Parliament were over land reform. So Parliament would pass a law that would aim at reforming land distribution, uh, which would aim at depriving big landholders of their of their of their land in the interest of a more equitable distribution. And the court would strike it down on the grounds of right to property, right to compensation and so on. And then the parliament would come back and amend the constitution and there'd be like a back and forth. But because this happened to be the court's most visible intervention into the public sphere. There was a perception, whether rightly or wrongly, that the court was an elite institution. Uh, its concerns were detached and divorced from the concerns of uh, of common man, common woman. Uh, and somewhere in the 80s, the court also began to, to feel that this is an impression that has to be corrected and that it needs to actually ensure that its role and its function is meaningful to the vast majority of the Indian public and therefore it embarked upon a radical overhaul uh, of its existing jurisprudence. And it began with Article 32. Now Article 32 says that the right to move the Supreme Court for enforcement of fundamental rights is guaranteed. But throughout history there has been a presumption, and that a presumption borrowed from English common law, that uh, only a person whose rights are violated can move the court. So if I am coming to the court, uh, I have to show that I have a right under the constitution that has been infringed or violated. I can't come to court and say that my friend's right has been violated, so please do something about it. Uh, now, the Supreme Court thought in the early 80s that, that this, this entire tradition that only a person whose rights have been violated can search the court, what we call standing to sue in, in, in technical terms, uh, effectively deprives a large section of the country from access to justice, access to courts. Because in a country where education levels are very low, uh, in a country where awareness levels are very low, in a country where, where you have a huge geographical spread, where courts are few, and where infrastructure is such that it's difficult often to just travel across the country, uh, this rule that only those people who could show their rights are violated can approach the court, effectively deprives a large chunk of population uh, from accessing justice, accessing the courts. So the court says that, look, uh, Article 32 only says that the right to move the court is guaranteed. It doesn't say that it has to be the person whose rights are violated. Therefore, uh, from now on, uh, if there are people who's, who are unable, for reasons of poverty, for reasons of access, to move the courts, then other citizens in the public interest can move the court on their behalf. Right? So this is the, um, the origin of public interest litigation. The idea being that um, that when those people who are being oppressed, when those people who whose rights are being violated are simply unable to come to court, then others must take up the mantle on their behalf and the court will entertain those kinds of cases. So in the, in the initial years, there were, there were three conditions that the court placed on public interest litigation. The first was that there must be people who are unable to approach the court. The second is that there must be public interest, there must be an issue that is in the public interest. And thirdly, that uh, the person who is coming to court on behalf of these other people must have bona fide motives, must have genuine, true, honest motives. It can't just be uh, in their own private interest. Uh, and so these are the three conditions under which the court began to open up itself uh, to greater access. Uh, and then you had cases involving migrant labor, uh, cases involving the rights of prisoners, uh, cases involving pavement builders, and so on. Uh, classically, people who were unable to approach the court themselves, and so needed somebody to approach the court on their behalf. Of course, once this happened, the court also found that uh, for many of these people who were 
who were suffering under certain kinds of conditions. It wasn't the case of direct state violation of your rights. Uh, so, for example, if you have pavement dwellers, uh, then you can't really point to some existing civil right in the constitution that's being violated. The reason for the condition is, are reasons of poverty uh, that are structural in nature, that, are, that have to do with the broader economy, the broader political choices being made by government and so on. You can't specifically point to one categorical right that's being violated. So the court says, okay, in, the, in that case, you will expand the meaning of rights. So Article 21 says the right to life and personal liberty. Uh, and of course, traditionally you think of the right to life as being a right against being killed by the state arbitrarily, right to personal liberty being a right not to be jailed arbitrarily. But the court says that look, the right to life it doesn't simply mean an animal existence. It means right to life with dignity, right to life with access to facilities that make life worth living. And so in the 1980s, the court begins to expand Article 21. Uh, and for example, in a famous case called Olga Telles, uh, the court says that uh, the right to life includes the right to livelihood. And therefore, uh, you know, under Article 21, there is a right to livelihood, not just the right to live. And you have other cases uh, that the same right of prisoners uh, to, not, to not be handcuffed and so on. Uh, so, well, on the one hand, the court is opening up access to itself by loosening the rules of, of standing. On the other hand, it's also increasing the scope of its powers by saying Article 20 on the right to life actually is very, very broad in, in, in nature. It includes a lot of subsidiary rights that you wouldn't think of as being about the right to life. Uh, and as the court is doing these two things, it also understands that uh, to effectively fashion remedies for these people, it can't again be stuck to the old model of having an order that says, okay, your rights have been violated now, a law is struck down as unconstitutional or a law is, is hereby read down. There must be a broader set of actions the court can take to effectively provide remedies to these people. And so the court is Article 142 that you know talks about complete justice and says, okay, uh, given that we have a right to complete justice, we will now pass uh, wide-ranging orders to ensure that justice is done. And these orders include, for example, appointing committees to oversee the implementation of a court order. So if the court says that um, in, in X place, there is a violation of people's rights to livelihood, or they are not being paid a minimum wage, the court will then appoint a committee to oversee that the wage is paid to the people. And so under Article 142, the court begins to expand its powers and uh, undertake action that would normally be associated with the implementation or administration of policies, which are executive tasks. And the court's justification is that uh, once I can show that Article 21 is violated, there's a right that's violated, there should be uh, wide powers to ensure that there is a remedy. Otherwise, what's the point of a right if you can't have an effective remedy? So you see how these three articles, uh, Article 32 that is opened up with respect to access, Article 21 that um, that is read broadly and, and therefore the right to life means right to a bunch of things, and Article 142 that allows the court to fashion and mold remedies in innovative and creative ways to ensure that right is actually effectively exercised. Together, constructs a whole new uh, idea of how judges, courts, and the and the court's role. And that is effectively what PIL uh, comes out to be. And that's something that uh, Anush Bhavanyan discusses in his book in great detail. Uh, now also the court begins to find that, uh, that this entire structure, this system of adjudication is also inconsistent with the traditional judicial role where you have one party that comes to court and says, my rights have been violated. The other party says, no, that's incorrect. And the court will adjudicate between the two based upon the evidence that is before it. And evidence here would, would involve uh, witnesses coming and deposing, uh, cross-examination of the witnesses, so that over, over the course of a trial, the course of a proceeding, the truth comes out through a very, very comprehensive adversarial process. The court says that, look, that model is no longer applicable because we are now dealing not with a fight between an individual and the state, we are dealing with what should be a collaborative effort between the court, the state and the individual. They all of us work together to ensure that rights are being effectively implemented. So this is no longer adversarial, no longer X against Y, they are all in it together. 
And so the court says, given that's the case, uh, you no longer need to have cross-examination of witnesses. You don't need to have a rigorous evidentiary procedure that is required to establish truth. We will just call for uh, committees. We will call for documents. And we will decide the case based on reading those documents and, and those committee reports. So what happens is that as a corollary to PIL, uh, the role of evidence in, in court, the role of evidence in judicial proceedings uh, goes down a lot. And the court needs to rely upon committee reports and these kind of documents to establish uh, judgments, establish truth. And we see how that plays a very significant role uh, in the liquor land um, So in the 1980s, you have this sense of PIL being an attempt to uh, ensure that justice is provided to the poorest, the most marginalized, the most vulnerable sections of society through the mechanism of Article 21, 32, and 142. But as we now know, uh, that wasn't a basic piece of PIL. It was a function of the fact that the judges who created PIL were of that ideological and political view. Uh, in their view, what was important was that um, justice be accessible to all. And they created PIL to ensure that happened. But in the 1990s, you had new judges for whom that was no longer a priority, for whom the issue of access to justice for the poorest and most marginalized uh, was no longer of overriding importance. There were other things that were very important, the environment, for example, um, and, and so on. And at that time, you see that the PIL which effectively uh, demolished all the traditional constraints upon judging and judges. Constraints of standing, constraints of evidence, constraints of, of limited orders had now all been, been removed. And therefore, judges who came from a different ideological uh, and political background uh, viewpoint were able to use the end of those constraints to, to implement their own vision. And PIL therefore became a tool for a different kind of vision. Uh, for example, in the 1990s, there were a series of judgments that uh, sought to uh, make Delhi, the capital, a more environmentally friendly city. And so you had OPIL orders that, that required uh, all industrial units to be moved outside Delhi. You had uh, Delhi High Court in some of the judgments uh, dealing with uh, pollution in Delhi. And all these judgments had a very uh, um, elaborate set of effects that are still being studied. For example, in a judgment with respect to uh, auto rickshaws in Delhi, the court says, the court puts a cap or a freeze on the number of auto rickshaws in Delhi on manmetry grounds, pollution grounds. And uh, Guwani in his book points out that an impact of this judgment, the order, was that, um, that auto drivers uh, lost out on becoming individual owners of autos and had to outsource or sell the autos to financiers and, and went from being entrepreneurs in their own right to wage laborers. And so you have this situation where the court begins to pass these wide-ranging, uh, widely impacting orders. And the impact is not just again on how it's framed by the court as environment and pollution, but on livelihoods, on careers, on life itself. But that's never um, an issue that the court considers. And then in the 2000s, you have a third shift where from, from poverty in the 80s to environment in the 90s, now governance is the, is the main concern. And that's because from the mid 80s, you have an era of coalition governments in, 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 in the center, widespread corruption allegations, a standstill in you know, uh, governance. And so what becomes of paramount importance is that parliament is stalled, parliament isn't working. Executive is stalled, executive isn't working. Nothing is happening in the country. No laws are being made, nothing is being implemented. There's a vacuum of power. And so the court is the only institution that can actually do something. And so again, given that PIL has effectively removed all kinds of constraints from the court's powers, the court now assumes power to govern. Uh, and again, in a series of cases uh, involving anti-corruption investigations and so on, but the court effectively begins to uh, supplant uh, the role of the parliament, of the executive uh, in, uh, uh, in, in governance. And that's when you see, begin to see the first kind of pushback to this, when uh, MPs begin to say, okay, activism is out of control, activism cannot be uh, a euphemism for the court replacing elected 
member of parliament and so on. Uh, but what you do have uh, around 2010, 2011 is you have three decades of PIL. Uh, and nobody is quite clear about what PIL is about anymore. So you, you began with access to justice, uh, improving the quality of life of marginalized people, you moved on to environment, you moved on to corruption, you moved on to a lot of other things. And the only uh, certainty at this point is that PIL allows for judges to effectively implement their visions of, of what good governance is like uh, without any traditional constraints upon the legal role. Beyond that, nobody knows what the limits and, and the scope really is. And that then leads you on to judgments like the back judgment. Uh, and if you read the judgment carefully, it's a small judgment, 20, 28 pages, you will see that each of the issues that I have talked about is very clearly in evidence in that judgment. And how is that so? So, the court begins by saying that we are very mindful of the fact that we should not overstep our role. You know, our role is not governance, our role is not to pass laws. Our role is only to you know, effectively decide cases and effectively implement constitutional rights. That's our, our role. So the court begins by acknowledging that. But then all that it does in the judgment is effectively the opposite of that. Uh, so to begin with, the court says that okay, then there are lots of reports that the government has issued. They draw a link between uh, road accidents, drunken driving, and availability of alcohol along national highways. So there is like a government finding on that. Um, and given this government finding, we will accept that the finding is true. Uh, fine, so far that's okay, there's nothing particularly controversial there. <coughs> The court then says that given you have this government report, these government reports that uh, draw this link between uh, drunken driving and alcohol on the highways and road accidents, and given that the government has not taken any action on that, uh, we'll take action. Right? Uh, so again, you have the same logic that uh, there is a set of facts the court relies upon, and the court says, look, these facts give rise to a, a certain concern. Uh, and if the parliament will not act, then, then we will. We will fill the vacuum. Uh, now, what is the constitutional concern? That's the second point. The court says that Article 21, right to life, includes the right to be safe by being on the highway, it includes the right against being killed by rash driving, uh, and uh, includes the right to like uh, a dignified life. The court begins with that. Uh, and so, given that drunken driving and road accidents uh, violate your right to life. Uh, and given that the state is not doing anything about that, the state is in breach of its obligation in Article 21 to protect life. And therefore, the court, we the court, find the state to have you know, uh, not fulfilled its obligation in Article 21. And so we will ensure that obligations are fulfilled by banning alcohol shops um, along highways. Now that reasoning is, is really problematic because there are many things that do have an impact upon life in the long term. So for example, eating junk food will ultimately in the long run uh, cause harm to your health and your life. Smoking will do the same. Uh, now does that mean the court can pass an order requiring the state, the union, the parliament to ban junk food, to ban smoking? Uh, it can't, right? Uh, because ultimately this is a very complex issue of, of causation. Uh, what causes a certain outcome and not only is it an issue of causation but also a balance between on the one hand ensuring bad outcomes are not, do not happen and respecting individual choice. Now I might say that uh, the, the junk food will lead to my eventual death but I still choose to my right to eat junk food uh, and so so therefore, uh, despite this outcome being a bad outcome, there should still be respect for my choice. Constitution guarantees that. Uh, and so it can't simply be that because X leads to Y outcome, that in itself becomes an Article 21 issue for the court to intervene. But that analysis you don't see in the court's judgment at all. The court simply says that once we find that there is a link between drunken driving and uh, road deaths, once we find that Article 21 does have a, give you a right against being killed on the road, then that's it. There's no further in, inquiry over there. We will issue the step of banning uh, alcohol bars along highways. The second thing the court also does is that 
uh, again, as we discussed with you all before, the court says that because the parliament isn't acting, uh, because the executive isn't acting, we will act. But that again is a, is, is a logic that's not really valid because the three wings of, of state, the parliament, the executive and the courts, have different responsibilities, have different capacities and have different institutional considerations. So when the court says that because there is no action there, we will act, the court is saying that there is actually no, no distinction between the kinds of functions that are performed by elected bodies, the parliament and executive, and the functions performed by the court which is not elected. And, and there are two different issues here. The first is that when you are thinking of banning things and affecting the rights of people, then there must be a certain kind of the legitimacy you have to do that. And that comes from being elected. Right? So if parliament passes a law banning something, that law comes from the fact that parliament has been uh, put there by the people. And there is a certain kind of basic uh, legitimacy to its decision. The court doesn't have that. And secondly, it is that when you think again of, of banning something like alcohol, it is classically what Fuller called polycentric. The impact of that decision will have a ripple effect that goes far beyond just the ban itself, as, as we've seen over the last few months. And then again, the judicial forum, where you have basically people coming and arguing on law, isn't the right forum to, to adjudicate upon all the ripple effects that might you know, con uh, be consequent on that decision. Again, it's the parliament where these issues can be debated in detail with evidence uh, as opposed to the court. And again, you see that given that the court over the PIL years has effectively done away with evidentiary requirements, you not only have the court's court decisions being far reaching, but also being taken on minimal evidence. So here again, the court relies upon some documents that uh, have been issued by the union government. It ignores the fact that there is a large amount of literature on the issue that actually removing an alcohol shop from the highway's edge to say a kilometer in inwards is not going to have any impact because people who want to drink will still make the trip and drink and come back to the highway. So the court ignores the fact that it's uh, the empirical basis for its decision is itself problematic, flawed, uh, not certain and nonetheless goes ahead with this judgment. Okay. So, and, and in the last paragraph of the judgment, the court says that uh, you make it clear that this entire order is under Article 142 of the Constitution. So you see how a combination of these three articles, in the way they have been interpreted by the court over the years, uh, lead to the liquor ban judgment. So Article 32, uh, PIL provision, this was a PIL, the liquor ban uh, judgment against the PIL, where some person decides one morning that there is a problem in the country and is able to, to move the court and get a hearing on this social problem. And, and a judgment. And this is a far cry from the original idea that the PIL is on behalf of those who can't come to the court themselves. Now, basically, you have any person who just who can come to the court and uh, uh, initiate proceedings, which will then have a, a large impact upon the country. And also, the uh, national anthem judgment, for example, is a bit like this, where one person gets up in the morning and says it's a very, very bad thing that uh, national anthem is not being played in cinema halls. Uh, there is widespread disrespect for our country's symbols. He comes to court and the court says, we agree, we have a pass an order, making it compulsory. So, I mean, this is really not the way that uh, judging is supposed to happen. This is not the way that the court is supposed to really function uh, in the absence of clear legal standards. So, that's Article 32. Article 21, the right to life, its expansion over the years. In this case, you see the court says that Article 21 is, is a right to life. It includes the right to not die in a road accident. Therefore, any kind of causal factor which leads to that can be banned under the court. So you have Article 21, uh, 21's wide interpretation coming to play here. And of course, 142 that allows the court to effectively uh, pass orders that are, in the sense, uh, law-making in nature, uh, effectively passing laws under the guise of Article 142. So, in conclusion, therefore, um, what is the way forward? I think uh, a way forward is uh, that throughout the last three decades or so, in the public sphere, in the public domain, uh, we've, off, we've almost always uh, critiqued the court based on its outcomes. Uh, if something looks good to us, then we say good judgment. Uh, you know, uh, Sobrata Roy is 
uh, it has has done X Y Z. Good thing in fact today. I mean, it's a good thing the court is cracking down on this kind of behavior. If it's uh, something that we don't approve of or we think is a bad outcome, then we say this judgment is wrong. So national anthem days, many people have said that why should uh, the court enforce this kind of uh, nationalistic sentiment on the population? It's, it's the wrong thing, uh, and therefore it's a bad judgment. Now I think we have to move beyond this kind of uh, critique of the court based upon its outcomes, because ultimately a, a court or a judicial forum uh, is not meant to first decide the case and then reverse engineer reasoning. Ultimately, the court is meant to reason from existing law, the existing constitution, and arrive at whatever conclusion is justified. And therefore, the, the basis of critiquing the court has to be that its reasoning is not strong, its reasoning is not correct. And so, for example, in the liquor ban case, uh, the critique, of, it's obviously important to say that that the court judgment impacts livelihood, impacts uh, people's careers, and that is effect effectively enforcing a certain kind of, of narrow worldview on the country. But it's even more important to say that the court's understanding of Article 21 is a problem. Uh, this kind of broad reading of Article 21 isn't borne out by Constitution's text or its structure. And it's equally important to say that the court cannot be taking such decisions. Uh, without a detailed evidentiary uh, standard being laid down. And the court cannot take these decisions simply because one person decides one day that there's a problem and then comes to court and, and wants that problem to become a, a, a legal issue and not a political issue. So if we can actually try and focus on the court's reasoning uh, uh, to critique it, then I think then there's a way forward in getting a culture where the court is held accountable to the people for its reasoning and not simply for its outcomes, which are basically very subjective uh, judgments and, depend, and then depend upon what an individual person feels about that particular outcome. So I think that might be a way of thinking of the court that will help us to escape from the present situation we are in. And it will also help to ensure that PIL uh, is in a sense uh, a little more disciplined than it is right now and, and, only, and is only used when there is a strong justification in the constitution uh, for it to be used. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude and, and open it up. Uh, thank you very much, Gautam. Is it true that the Supreme Court is considering regulating the amount of sugar in uh, sweets, Indian sweets, these sweets and such? I mean, there's, there's some sort of story going around that it might even come to that. Uh, Supreme Court regulating the amount of sugar you can consume, uh, the amount of anything <laughs> that you can consume. Uh, no, but uh, jokes apart, uh, very one very quick, uh, not question, but uh, comment. Uh, I'm familiar with the term of judicial overreach, but there's also judicial activism. Yeah. Where does, is there a shifting boundary as far as, uh, you know, the idea of judicial overreach and judicial activism is concerned? Personally, I'm not a fan of the term judicial activism because I think it's rather empty term conceptually. I, I don't know what it's supposed to signify. Um, and in many judgments, you have you know the court saying that you must be activist, you must you know um, do X, Y, Z. I think the the question is that a question should be that uh, if you have a court judgment, or is it a defensible view of the judgment based upon the constitution's text, its overall structure, its history, and and previous cases? If there is uh, a, a defense, then the judgment is broadly correct. And if there isn't, then it's wrong. So I think that activism is just uh, muddies up the issue. It's not a question of the court being activist or restrained. It's a question of the court uh, ensuring a certain fidelity to the constitutional uh, text, which is the basis of its of its power. So I think, I think the question should be focused on that. And terms like this tend to be more than anything else. Okay, uh, we're going to have questions. Uh, we want to answer them one by one, or okay. So members of the audience. Do you have any questions? I am Shoma, the reporter from Loving Times. So you said that the judgment does not respect individual choice. But uh, how can you talk of individual choice when there are drug drivers on the road, they are not educated. So they uh, they are easily swayed uh, by liquor and uh, you know presence of liquor. So in that case, like um, how can you say of individual choice? No, sir, I, I should clarify that the individual choice issue wasn't 
uh, I have said you with respect to this judgment, but a, a broader a broader point about when the Supreme Court decides to ban something, that there is always a consideration that there must be respect to individual choice. Now the court might say, okay, fine, with respect to issues like say drugs or even alcohol, even if there are addictive substances, there is no there is a less there is a less of an issue with respect to choice over there. But that still must play some role in the reasoning. It can't be completely abandoned, and it has to be there. And the court must uh, explain why. If it is going to override that, that aspect of choice, uh, then why is doing so? And here the choice isn't simply choice of, of drivers, it's also the choice of shopkeepers, the choice of, of restaurant owners to uh, you know, uh, conduct a certain kind of business. It's not just the drivers themselves, it's a broader issue of choice, which goes to the economy as a whole. I'm Vilas Bhaktin, I'm just a law graduate, I've just finished law school. Uh, my first question is, would you be able to tell us a few instances where uh, the court has distorted what is what you feel or what uh, scholars feel is the original meaning of Article 142? Right. Apart from this, as in uh, the power to do complete us. Yeah. Yeah. And my second question is, would you put the Vishakha guidelines in the same class of uh, cases as this? I mean, people, it was hailed as something that was uh, yeah. way ahead of its time when it laid down not a guidelines with respect to sexual harassment. Would you put it in the same class as the case, the court going beyond its uh, constitutional mandate? In certain cases, as the case is going on between two parties, the court will need to sometimes do something that isn't explicitly allowed to it by the text of the CPC or procedural law. I'll give you an example. Uh, in, in many cases, uh, the court has found that um, a certain powerful figure is being tried or, or you always being uh, uh, the trial against them. And that that powerful figure has a lot of influence in, in the area where the trial is. Therefore, there's a good chance that the trial will be vitiated if he's allowed to stay over there. So therefore, the court often shifts that person from jail X in that area to a different jail. Now, there is no provision in the, in the court of criminal procedure that allows the court to do that. Now, in that kind of case, the court in most of but that's fine because the idea is that you have a case, two parties before it, right? and you need to do something, you have to slightly tweak procedure to ensure that you know you have justice. That's okay. What isn't okay is that 142 becomes uh, a shield for, for, for passing laws. Right? So I, this um, uh, alcohol ban judgment, national anthem is another one, where again the court in, doesn't well, doesn't invoke it directly, but it is like clearly the basis. But the court says that look, uh, 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 there is a problem in the country and we have to solve the problem and therefore we will do whatever it takes to solve it. And that's something that 142 was not meant to, uh, to, to cover. And if you read the debates of the, of the assembly, there was, a, there was a very, very strong fear that this would be the outcome of, uh, of having an article like this. Many people didn't want it and that's what it's become. So yeah, in brief, in brief um, 142 is, is justified when you are tweaking procedure to achieve a certain kind of outcome within the overall framework of the trial, of the criminal trial. It's not justified when um, uh, when uh, you are making laws, passing laws. Okay, Vishakha, um, right? So, so Vishakha is one of those cases um, where it's it's effectively uh, become part of the constitutional canon. So, anyone who doesn't know Vishakha, uh, Vishakha is a case where the Supreme Court uh, held that. Sexual harassment is a constitutional issue and passed uh, detailed guidelines uh, that uh, had the force of law uh, that would be applicable uh, for dealing with harassment in the workplace. Uh, now I think I think the important thing about Vishakha is to divide into two different uh, parts. So one part is the finding on law, uh, when the court finds that uh, sexual harassment in the workplace impacts the rights of women under Articles 14, Equality and 15, Clause 1, Discrimination. Uh, and I think that's correct. Uh, that's also been the finding that has uh, characterized other courts. So the uh, European Court of Human Rights has also held that sexual harassment is a gender issue and impacts rights of women under, under discrimination law. Uh, African courts have held that. Lugandan, the Court of Uganda has held that. Latin American courts have held that. Right? So I think I think that's quite a strong argument. It's a correct one. Right? Uh, now the question is that once the court finds that um, sexual harassment is a violation of the constitution 
and the state is not taking action, uh, uh, taking action to remedy that, what should the court do? Right? Now, in my view, the second part, where the court decides that we will effectively pass law, is not correct. Right? So the court can the court can rule that uh, there is a constitutional violation. It can hold the state accountable for that violation. It can even and it should in fact say that okay, given the state is not uh, fulfilling its obligation under Article 14 and 15, and so there will be a right to compensation. Right, so a woman who is sexually harassed can claim compensation from the state uh, for her rights being violated, and that's been done in other places. What the court can't and shouldn't do is effectively pass a law and say okay, now henceforth this will be the, right, the, the rules on harassment. Right? That's beyond its competence. And I know this is a very almost heretical view to take because Vishaka is a judgment which nobody will ever criticize. Right? It's not a gold standard of Indian constitutional law. But I think that uh, that that Vishaka is what then gives you national anthem. Vishaka is what gives you liquor ban. So if you want to criticize liquor ban, you want to criticize national anthem, you have to also criticize Vishaka. So if you're being uh, consistent over the issue of principle, then Vishaka has to be equally a wrong judgment. Uh, as, as you do. Yeah. I am Tenzo Nunes. Uh, I am a wine shop owner, affected with the Supreme Court bench. Uh, my uh, colleagues also here in front, Dr. Prasad Naik, is the president of the Goa Liquor Trade Association. And he's taking a lot of initiatives, initially before the ban happened and after the ban happened, having several meetings uh, with Liquor Trade Association, uh, like, uh, members like me, who don't have too much knowledge about law and, you know, in one of the meetings, you know, one of my colleagues uh, said, you know, there is a judgment that happened close by to the Siddhanti Goa Hotel, uh, wherein the local government had an ordinance and, you know, overruled the Supreme Court judgment regarding some, you know. Uh, so, it, one of my colleagues asked the question to the bench, like, you know, and we were told that uh, it is not a fundamental right to sell liquor in India. Hmm. And uh, so, the, everybody can decide uh, you should stop selling liquor or uh, is, is it is it uh, is it a fact? Uh, is it like possible? Because for me, it wasn't a fund, if, if it wasn't a fundamental right of selling liquor, it was fundamental right to live. I was doing a business like any other businessman, and I was not forcibly forcing it down somebody's throat. Or if you're a bus driver or a truck driver, I was not happy because you're buying liquor for me. And I've not been selling liquor illegally. I've been paying all my taxes from municipal to excise to salaries to everything. I have not done an illegal business. And still I've been told now after 18 years that it's not a fundamental right to sell liquor. What happened was that in the 1950s, uh, there were many uh, state prohibition laws that were passed. Uh, in, in Bombay, the state, state of Bombay back then and other states. Um, and uh, these laws were challenged before the Supreme Court. That time it was very new, just because of the Constitution. And in, in those cases, and I think very unfortunately, very tragically, uh, the Supreme Court says that uh, that 19G of the Constitution that uh, guarantees a fundamental right to trade, commerce, and so on, uh, doesn't include the right to trade in alcohol. Uh, and, and the court basically uses this Latin expression called uh, res extra commotion, which means that uh, something that is beyond ordinary commerce and the court says that uh, you know alcohol is something that's not really part of ordinary trade. Now, I mean, of course the reason for that is a certain moral, moral viewpoint. The court is basically echoing a certain uh, moral argument that alcohol is bad, that alcohol, that you know, alcohol leads to broken families, drunken diet and so on. Uh, and I think it's a problem when the court needs to impose that, that moral view on the country as a whole. But it is correct that the court has held a very clearly that there is no fundamental right uh, to trade in alcohol. That, that, that's a statement of law, that's a correct statement. Though I would say that um, that given the same Supreme Court has also held in 1980 that the right to life, uh, includes the right to livelihood, uh, I think to that extent it should definitely be arguable that um, if not a question of the right to trade, then at least it's a question of right livelihood being impacted by this kind of position. So, thank you. I'm the president of the Goa Legal Traders Association. With me are also the affected parties as Denzel was one. Also Mr. Jokim and uh, Mr. 
Sylvester, who owns a restaurant in a city called is Vasco da Gama. Uh, this is one city which just has one survivor, in the sense, as a, a bar. So the entire city of Vasco today has just one bar license, as it's covered by national ID on all the sides. And, uh, during your lecture, as you said, a person who wants to drink can go 500 meters ahead and he can buy his alcohol and definitely consume. Uh, let me just give you some statistics. In the last five, last five years, there is just one registered death due to drunk and driving. And on 31st, after 31st of March, we had 3,210 liquor shops which were completely shut down. There was not a single liquor shop open or a bar open on any of the national or the state highways. And if you take the statistics from 5th of April till 12th of uh, April, that's that one week, we had around 13 deaths. And there were some major accidents across Goa. Now this clearly shows that the, you know, just closing the wine shops on the highways is not the solution, as you have also pointed out. Now my question to you is, like we have today 2,200 liquor shops closed in Goa. 1,000 shops got a relief because Supreme Court gave some relief of the distance of 220 meters. Now, what do you feel is the way forward? Is there some solution? Because different associations, different organizations, governments across India have gone to the Supreme Court with an appeal. Goa government also is going to file an appeal. So, do you feel that there are any chances of some more modifications which are going to come up in this judgment and provide further relief to the dealers? One good thing about the Supreme Court now is nothing is ever final. Right? So, so uh, there's always scope for modification. In fact, I think just last week there was a modification in this case. Um, so I think yes, I think it makes sense to to um, to bring fresh evidence before the court, as the evidence you have said, that there's actually no discernible impact of this uh, of this ban upon uh, accidents. In fact, it's the other way around. Um, and you know, uh, can keep trying until we get a favorable order. Uh, of course, the problem is that the Supreme Court is also very reluctant to change its mind. Uh, and the um, also, and so, so one thing people sometimes do is that they wait for a while, and then the bench will change, and then you know, a different bench might have a different point of view. It's obviously a fair thing to do. Uh, but I think this this bench will continue for a very long time. So I think that isn't really an option. Though I think so. I, so I think there is a chance of modification, but it's, I mean. It's a fair chance. I wouldn't be very, very optimistic, but it's possible. I think the I think the solution has to be political in this, in that the in that either through an ordinance or through a law, uh, the Supreme Court judgment can be overturned. And it is very accepted that the parliament, state parliaments, and the executive, uh, they do have the right to overturn a Supreme Court judgment by passing a law, taking away its basis. Right? So so if politically uh, it is possible to persuade or convince. Uh, the state assembly, uh, you know, to uh, to pass an ordinance or a law that will modify, mitigate the impact of the judgment, then that should be a uh, something worth considering. Um, in the court, I think it's doubtful, possible but doubtful. But of course, you never know. basically undermine uh, the, the very objective behind um, uh, 
say, improving the quality of democracy or delivering justice. And what, what they end up doing is uh, doing the, uh, achieving the exact opposite effect. Um, so at least around the jurisdiction that I'm familiar with, so the Anglophone jurisdiction of the US, Canada, European Court of the criminal procedural rights, it, uh, it, it uh, develops right to privacy, it develops other such rights, uh, pro versus weight, which came to laughter. And in all these cases, the court uses uh, this expanded notion of rights to strike down laws that would you know, be unconstitutional. And that's the extent of activism there. Because here, activism basically is the court governing. It's that, that's the acting laws. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mr. Balkum. Uh, it was very really nice on part of you that you were highlighting the other impacts of the recovery. It's also the impacts on the society. Like, let me just uh, get one thing to your notice that uh, has been happening in Goa after the recovery. Like, uh, see, the entire motto of the Supreme Court for getting this judgment was to probably drunken driving. And drunken driving to prevent road accidents. If it had an intention is to do something good for the society. The bad thing that has happened after this is the corruption that is going on in various government departments. I guess Denzel said when he was to go in his question that he is someone who is doing business by paying all his taxes. He is a licensed premises. Now this judgment has given a rise to all the illegal outlets coming up. Now, as the illegal outlets have come up, it's not only the illegal outlets selling liquor, it's the illegal outlets selling spurious liquor, which is even more dangerous for the society today. Now, that is what has started across India and we feel it is also going to probably start in Goa. We have a very good chief minister for which at least the illegal alcohol is out of the Goan market. But we really fear that that also is going to be the case. And as a consumer today, the consumer in certain areas, like probably in Moscow, my friends here, they are paying at least two to three times more than the actual price of the goods that they were buying. So this has directly impacted even the consumers. So probably as uh, I would request you as you are travelling across India probably on this issue to even highlight this and probably even, even to the notice of the Supreme Court that this is another impact which is directly affecting the consumers and as an ordinary Indian citizen. No, that's a, that's a great point because it's, it's, it's by now I, I think established wisdom that whenever you ban something, you are creating a black economy. This is it's been proven in everything. So many countries, and so many times. In the US, prohibition was was finally stopped because you had a black economy, among, among other things. Uh, and if I'm not, I, I, I'm not sure if I think this point was made. Uh, I think uh, one of the council, Mr. Arvind Dada, I think he made the point, but I checked, I checked and, 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 and. No, but as part of, you know, evidence gathering, I mean, uh, the idea that prohibition almost never works. I mean, that, there's substantial evidence for that. And if the Supreme Court has not reasoned, I mean, if it, uh, they have simply come up with this idea, you know, not considering all that evidence uh, about prohibition not being effective, but then clearly there's, there's a problem with reasoning as well. Yes, as, uh, yeah, as a doctor, Dr. Pushkar, you should know better. No, I'm not then, <laughs> okay, <laughs> then, see, what is it? Because last, uh, in one of the debates, I had one of the doctors who was a panelist on uh, some of our local television channels. And then the doctor was always, you know, he was for the liquor ban. He was saying a lot of cases are coming to us uh, that uh, people are drinking and fighting at home and all those uh, legal cases. See, a person who wants to drink, it's just like an addiction. A person who wants to go to a casino for gambling or who wants to play matka, he's never going to stop. Whatever you ban gambling, he's going to play matka or he's going to find some other alternatives to that. Now, in Goa, we are one market which gives clean alcohol. You will have, if I can assure you, in the last five, six years, there were no cases of any uh, fake alcohol or spurious alcohol sold in Goa. Now, this is only going to give rise, you know, an opportunity for people to sell fake alcohol because as we as distributors, we cannot today sell to any person 
who is a non-licensed premises. A wholesale license that we have, we can only sell to a person who is having a restaurant with a license or a wine shop with a license. So now people are just buying from here and there and it's going to be a problem for the health also of the citizens of India. As uh, even Bihar is one example. So Bihar today, all the spurious alcohol has really gone up with the liquor ban there. It was not that it was not there before, it was always there. The spurious alcohol was 90% in Bihar and the official sales were 10%. So it's become 100% spurious there now with the liquor ban. Okay. I think uh, the, the liquor issue and the justification of whether prohibition and all like that uh, gives rise to even those who say that drugs should be legalized. Why should the state government uh, uh, ban drugs? You know, so this thing can go on. But the problem is, uh, how come the the Supreme Court or any other uh, judicial has actually uh, come to this point of starting to dictate, you know, uh, policies and laws? Uh, is it because we the people, okay? have now sort of given up our responsibilities. We want someone else to do it, either the NGOs or the activists to do it, you know. And a total failure of the state, which does not listen to uh, people's uh, requests or, or comes to some moral decision or whatever it is on, on various issues. For instance, uh, since we are talking of liquor, okay, liquor, we, we may talk about li right to livelihood, right to drink and everything, but I think in many countries there are also restrictions uh, that uh, say maybe when the person who is selling liquor notices a person is drunk, he has to take his keys, uh, there are, uh, he has to see that this person is uh, dropped home safely, otherwise he is liable for, uh, for the, any uh, accident or anything that this person makes. Now in absence of this these laws which also discourage abuse of liquor, okay, uh, then the whole thing comes in that someone has to approach the court when, when governments do not respond. I have worked in this whole field of alcoholism, drug addiction, and we have been telling government that yes, people drink, we are not ready to, uh, I am not the one who says that people should not drink, I am also against and, and rightly agree that prohibition uh, creates all sorts of uh, uh, underground activities, okay, it becomes a parallel economy to the state, you know. Certain politicians are running a parallel government when it comes to uh, uh, alcohol sale. So, uh, but on the other hand is also the health of society, okay. And when the state fails repeatedly, does not res respond, then people have to approach the courts, okay. Even after, now we see it with NGT, the, the National Green Tribune is issuing uh, notices to the state government. The state government does not act. Okay. The state government just uh, ignores the courts. In that situation, uh, on the, uh, people also don't continue, uh, don't come forward and take on the government and push the government to, to frame policies that are uh, benefiting the, the larger society. So in this situation, uh, the court becomes the, the, the last refuge, so to say, of the citizens who really feel that something wrong is going on. Both the state has failed and the people also are not rising against the state. We see the same type of leaders coming in who are not interested in the society. So what would be your opinion about this? Um, I said the vacuum is, is a massive problem for any state. Failure of governance leads to all kinds of issues. I think the, the key question, at least with respect to what, what you're saying, is that uh, in the long run, uh, is resting these kinds of powers in the court uh, a good thing or a bad thing for society? And uh, and again, on this issue, opinions may differ. But my view, based on, on what I have seen so far and what I have read, is that in the long run, it doesn't work. Because, uh, because the, the judicial forum is simply not equipped to effectively uh, deliver on these issues. So you will have short term, based on short term benefits, um, but in the long term it's going to be counterproductive and, and you have evidence of this. So, for example, there's, there's a very famous um, case called uh, Godavarman's case, which I'm sure you've heard of. 
uh, where uh, the Supreme Court effectively has taken over the management of the forests of India. Uh, now, when it, when it, when it began, it, it, was, it was praised because of the fact that the state simply wasn't interested in preserving forests. Someone had to step in and do it. But over time, it's been found that, that the court's interim orders on in Godavarman's case are creating more issues than they're solving. Right? And I think it's, it's not the court's fault. The court has the best of intentions. But ultimately, that forum is not a forum where you can develop complex solutions to complex problems. There has to be elsewhere. And if so, uh, um, and, and for, I think that ultimately, if the parliament is failing, then the answer isn't the court. It's something else, but it's not, it's not the court. I, I, that's my view. But again, I understand that people could very well defer this for very good reasons. So it's not, I think, the final word. Nice information about the Supreme Court judgment on liquor ban, and we are talking about judicial activism. Uh, I, as a journalist, I found that whatever decisions Supreme Court gives beyond their judicial constraints are welcomed by the common people because they find that. The two pillars of democracy, legislature and executive, they are not delivering their duties. So people find there is no hope and the Supreme Court just comes in and resolves the matter. Now regarding the Supreme Court's liquor ban judgment, as per my information, earlier one PIL has been uh, filed by one orthopedic doctor in Supreme Court regarding road accidents. And on basis of that judgment, Supreme Court has formed a committee consisting of a retired uh, Supreme Court uh, judge. And all states have been told to frame their road safety policies. In Goa also, they have framed road safety policy without consulting anyone because Supreme Court decision, no, no consultation. They have just notified the policy and they have put in the policy that they are going to reduce the road accident 50% by 2020. Nobody knows about that policy. Only director who has issued that notification knows that we have notified the policy. When our governance, when our government and executive are working in this fashion, there is no other way for a Supreme Court to overstep and to become more active for the safety and for the betterment of the public. Now, my question is simple to you, that if, suppose Supreme Court limits themselves with their restricted authority, will our democracy survive? No, I, I, think it, I think it will survive. Um, I, I don't think, I, I think in no democracy, I, I don't think any court ever in any part of the world has rescued democracy. I, I don't think it really has. And if you look at the history of courts everywhere, um, they have tended to uh, to fail when the stakes are high. Uh, this is true for for the US, uh, for the for the UK, for, for us as well. Habeas corpus, Indian level too, right? So, so I, I think we tend to often overestimate uh, what courts can do uh, and and what courts can do to save uh, democracy. But on your specific issue, I think so. There's been a fair bit of writing on on the point that uh, that when you uh, effectively. Uh, judicialize or constitutionalize political issues, then one side effect is that uh, you end up uh, killing possible social or political movements. And, it's, and this has been seen with a number of issues. Uh, uh, in the, the moment you file a PIL and the moment the court you know, is seized on the issue, then it, it's effectively a death knell to any kind of strong social movement on that issue. So I think that, uh, I, I don't know, I mean, I, again, it's a speculation, but I think that, uh, that if the court was was to actually withdraw, I, it won't, but just suppose it would, I think it might actually finally have people uh, faced with the necessity of, of developing, uh, you know, grassroots political and social movements that attempt to achieve the same goal without the court imposing on you from a top-down perspective. I could be completely wrong, but I think that might, you might actually see that happen. So, uh, but I think my basic point is that, um, that again, this could be in the long run, the court imposing these top-down solutions to social problems uh, doesn't work. I don't think it works. But again, I, I'm happy to be proven wrong on this. 
So, so what you're basically saying is that uh, if there was no such judicial intervention, repeated judicial intervention, then we the people, uh, we are constantly saying we the people, we elected our government, we would hold our government accountable in, in other ways by, say, you know, uh, through social protests and so on. That, you know, look, alcohol consumption is bad, and therefore, uh, what, we are, what we are going to do is uh, reduce the number of liquor outlets, for example, or uh, make sure that uh, only the licensed uh, uh, owners can sell uh, alcohol. But with the court stepping in, uh, there's no need for the people to come together and demand something from from uh, from the government that they have elected. Right? No, so I think I think I think I think it's important to distinguish the two different claims here. Uh, one is that by taking an issue into court, we're effectively diminishing the possibility of social action. So I think, and that has been I think there's a fair bit of scholarship on that. So I agree with that. But whether if the court was not to act. Uh, then you would actually have these movements. I don't. I think it's unproven. I, I'm not sure you would. Uh, political movements are difficult to organize, and so I don't know if that would be the result. But I think that that um, what is true is that the court dealing with issues does suppress the possibility of of you know non-judicial social movements uh, for time. I think I think the Narmada issue has been one where this has been repeatedly come up for you know, debate. That uh, was it. Was it a, a good strategic choice? Uh, to approach the court and have the whole issue in court, or was it not? And I, I don't know enough about the issues, I don't, I don't want to comment on it. But I think that this debate is something you see a lot in the Narvada uh, litigation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming and uh, for, for some very, very, very good questions. And uh, we'll, we'll have another talk uh, maybe in a month or so. Uh, and we are still trying to finalize the speaker. But I hope more of you can make it. and. Uh, uh, it was an excellent session. Thank you.